Well, grace and peace. Last week, we started a new sermon series called Rooted, as in trees and roots and uh, fruit that hang on trees. That's a metaphor that runs all the way through the Bible from the very beginning with the tree of life to the very end with the tree of life. And so uh, we are going to be using this metaphor during this series to express what God desires for us as individual disciples of Jesus, as well as for our church and every church. And that is to be deeply rooted so we can reach out wide to the world around us and bear the fruit of love that God has created us for. And so last week, we discovered something really powerful, and that is that everything that Jesus did, he did with the knowledge that he was the beloved son of God and God was well pleased with him. So when he went to the cross and endured all that he went through, he knew that God loved him, that he was the beloved child of God. And we take that truth and it's applied to our baptismal um, uh, identity. So when we are baptized, we receive that same identity that Jesus received from the Father at his baptism. And so I shared with you the, what I believe is the greatest words that Jesus ever heard. I share them to you last week and I repeat them this week to say that you are a beloved child of God. And God is well pleased with you. And that is your true identity. Now the world might say you are not enough. But God says you are my beloved child. And he is well pleased with you, not based on what we do or we don't do. He's based, he, his love is based on who he is as the God of love. Amen? You are a beloved child of God, and God is well pleased with you. God is uh, for us and not against us. It's so important that we see that God is for us. He was for Jesus and not against Jesus. He is for you and not against you. That God loves you. We read that this week in our intersection passages in Psalm 139. It's a psalm of David where David was told by God that God knows him from the inside out. And God created him, wonderfully made him. And that God loves him despite who he is. It's one of the greatest things. And one of my, um, in my studies this week, I came across this. that I shared this on social media, but I'm still blown away by this statement and how it connects to the series. It says, Psalm 139 invites us to receive an identity rooted not in the things we say about ourselves or the labels others assign us, but in the one who knows us more deeply and more lovingly than we could ever know ourselves. And so this week and the weeks that follow, we are going to answer the question, how should we respond to that identity as God's beloved children. How do we respond to that kind of love? When God says you are his beloved child, how do we respond to that love? And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, our response to the belovedness that God shows to us. Now, in order to answer that question, I'd like to ask another question. Who are you for? Who are you for? Or I could ask it this way, what are you for? Who or what are you for? Now, the church is typically known for what we're against. Now, we have a laundry list of things that we're against, right? But wouldn't it be cool if we would be known not for what we're against, but what we're for? That we would be known by the way that we love? Because that's what Jesus said that we should be known for by the way that we love. So who are you for? And those that you are for know that you're for them. When well, one, of, one of my children, now I will say this very, very near and dear, that I am for all three of my children. I am for all three of my children, Rebecca, Jacob, and Micah. But I recently had an opportunity to express how much I am for Micah. Now Micah has asked for a dog for a long time. And for those that know my story, know that I'm a very allergic to all pets. And that happened when I went through chemotherapy. It just destroyed my immune system. So uh, I'm allergic to everything, right? And so uh, Rebecca, years ago, and I'm for Rebecca, she twisted her daddy's arm and says, Daddy, I'd like to get a dog. And I say, well, I'm allergic to dogs. And she says, well, if we, what if we get a hypoallergenic dog, hypoallergenic dog, allergenic? 
And I was like, absolutely, let's do this. And so she picked out a Labradoodle, and we went and got it. And Ollie, uh, named after uh, Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, Ollie is her Labradoodle. And when Ollie was young, I, I had no allergies at all. But as Ollie got older, we realized he was more Labr Labrador than he was Poodle. And sure enough, he shedded like, you know, the whole house, right? So, um, and I started to sneeze. In fact, it got so bad that I went to the hospital. The allergies were so bad. And so I've been hesitant for obvious reasons to get another dog. But Micah continues to twist my arm. You know, and it's those little comments, if you love me, you would get a dog, right? And I said, I love you enough to get a dog, but never a cat. I don't love you that much. I am for you, Micah, for a dog, but I'm not for you enough to get a cat. And all the dog lovers in this place said amen, right? So uh, I am for Micah. So we're on a journey of trying to find a dog that is truly hypoallergenic and um, and I, I love my son, and I'll do anything for him because I am for him. And I want him to know that I'm for him. And that's the thing. Those that we're for in our life know that we're for them. In fact, we're known as people who love by the way that we love them. And it's important that we see that there's an action, intentionality to those that we're for. We can't just tell them we're for them. Forness, the ability to be for someone, requires us to do something to demonstrate their forness. God is for us and sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross. We know that he is for us because he showed us, he demonstrated that he loves us by doing. And so for us, when we answer the question, who are we for? If we answer the question, who do we love? They should know that we love them. They should know that we're for them because we've demonstrated that to them. And so with that in mind, during this series, I'd like to share with you four roots, four roots that demonstrate who we are for as a church, who we love as a church, and we'll put those on the screen. And, and I would like to say that these roots are like values. These are the way that we express the love that God shows us to those that we value, to those that we love. And so the first root, which we'll talk about today, is the love for God, for express intentionality. We not just say we love God, but we live for God. And the second root, which we'll get to next week, is the love for one another. And then the third week is the hardest one for many of us, and that is the love for ourselves. But Jesus taught we love God, we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So there is an element of loving ourselves and the healing that we desperately need, and we've got to intentionally uh, go into that tough area. And then the last week is a lo are the love for our city and the world, for God so loved the world and so we love the city and the world back. So those are four roots or four values that we're going to talk about. And for us as a church, this is what we want to be known for. And so when the world looks at Sandy Hook United Methodist Church, we don't want them to just know that we're for these by the way we talk about them. We want the world to look at us and say they are for God, for our neighbors, for ourselves, and for the world by the way that we live. And so these are the four roots. And so today we talk about the first root, and that is, uh, I think there's a slide for this, Natalie. Our first root is at Sandy Hook United Methodist Church is to love God with our everything. To love God with our everything. And so how do we love God with our everything? And it's very easy just to say we do, but how do we? And so for us to understand how to love God with our everything, and we'll see this love God with our, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, how do we do that? And I'm going to express to you, suggest to you, uh, uh, challenge you to say that Jesus showed us how to love God because he loved God with his everything. And so as we look to Jesus, as we look at the way that he loved his Father, we will find out how we are to love our Father in heaven. And so... Uh, today I share with you some little uh, historical context. This is a prayer shawl. 
It's a cheap one I got on Amazon. It's not legit, but it works. And so Jesus would have wore a prayer shawl, right? Because Jesus was Jewish. Uh, Jesus wasn't Christian. Jesus was Jewish, right? Jesus is Jewish. So Jesus would have wore this. And there's a lot I could say about this, but one of the things I could say about it is there's 613 uh, strings on this that stand for the 613 commandments that we see in the Torah. So there's 613. So the Jewish people, like Jesus, had a lot of habits that they went through, rhythms of life that they had that showed and reminded them of what they believed was the most important. And so Jesus would have done what all the uh, Jewish rabbis and disciples and that they would have, he would have wrapped his fingers, uh, he would have wrapped a string that represents the 613 commandments around his fingers. And he would have walked around like this with those fingers, with those 613. So everywhere he went, he was reminded of the 613 commandments that are in the Torah. Let me talk about the Torah real quick. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, right? It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. It's the Torah. The word Torah means the way. So for the Jewish people, the Torah was the way of life. It was the way to be a God-loving person. In fact, their love for God was expressed by obeying these 613 commandments. And so in order to love God in the where their minds, they were obedient to these 613 commandments. And so everywhere they went, they had it tied around their finger. If you forget something, what do you do? You tie a little string around your finger. I, I love that expression. And so they wouldn't forget what was most meaningful to them, the 613 commandments. And one of the things that Jesus would have prayed, and all Jewish people prayed, is the Shema. The Shema. S-H-E-M-A, found from Deuteronomy. The word Shema means to listen. Listen or hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus would have prayed this twice a day. And some Jews prayed it up to seven times a day. And they prayed it with their fingers rubbed. It wasn't just the words that they say. It wasn't just as they did prayers and say, I love you, God. That expressed love. It does. The words express love. But the actions, the obedience expresses love to God. And so Jesus comes, and Jesus as a good Jewish man, a good rabbi, a good teacher, a good master, would have walked around with his fingers wrapped, you know, the strings wrapped around expressing that. Then Jesus takes these 613 commandments, and he takes them and summarizes them, not with 613 commandments, but summarizes them with two and so Jesus takes the 613 and summarizes them down to two. Aren't you thankful that all we have is two instead of 613? Yeah, people like me with little minds, I love two. I, two is much more uh, uh, acceptable and uh, rememberable than uh, 613. So Jesus says the, the, the summary of the 613, the summary of the Torah is to love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is is what the 613 commandments are all about. And so for Jesus, Jesus came not just to say those words to us, but Jesus came to live out those words. When you look at Jesus, Jesus showed us how to live out those two commandments. Everything that Jesus did showed us how to love God, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So if we want to know how to love God, if we want to know how to love our neighbor, if we want to know how to love ourselves, we just look to Jesus. Jesus lived it out. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 6, what did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Torah. And so Jesus was the Torah in the flesh. Jesus was that Old Testament that those Jewish people live by and tap their door frames and wrap these strings to move from the words on a piece of paper to a body, the Son of God. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 1, what does John say? In the beginning was the Word, right? And then in verse 14, which we talked about in Advent, the, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, right? So Jesus was the embodied Torah. Now, this is so important because how many people here, just a quiz, want to love God? We all do, right? And how do we do that? It's more than words, friends. 
Now, I say I love God all the time in my prayers and everything, and I'm sure you do as well. But don't we want to follow in the footsteps of the one who showed us how to love God with his everything? In order for us to love God with our everything, we have to look to Jesus. And so we look at the gospel passage that we read this week. It's the story of Philip and Nathaniel from John chapter 1. It's a great story, and it was just read here a second ago. I love, <laughs> I love this. So, so Jesus is calling his disciples. And Jesus calls Philip. And Jesus says to Philip, follow me. In fact, if you look in the Gospels, he, that's how he calls disciples. He calls them and says, follow me. And so in order to be a disciple, and if you've been taking this Wednesday study, you've heard me say it over and over and over again, as a disciple is someone who follows Jesus. That's what a disciple is. So we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We do what Jesus did, and we become like Jesus. And so uh, Philip then says yes and follows in the footsteps of Jesus. And that's what a disciple does. They follow in the footsteps of their rabbi. In fact, they follow so close that one of their expressions is they uh, want the dust of the rabbi to get on them. They follow so close, and remember in the dusty roads, that they follow so close that all the dust that the rabbi stirs up on the roads gets all over the disciples. That's how close they want to be. And so Jesus says to Philip, follow me. And so what does uh, Philip then do? Philip goes and finds his buddy Nathaniel and says, hey, we have found the Messiah, the one that Moses talked about in the Torah. And so Nathaniel says, well, where is he from? And uh, I I love that. I love that, don't you? It's like, uh, he's from Nazareth. And then Nathaniel says, what? (laughs) Are you serious? What good can come from Nazareth? Because Nazareth was a very poor town. They were in the hill country. They were, would probably would be like known today, the like hick town, right? And they had a particular accent. And so everyone knew by listening to people that they were from Nazareth. And so Jesus was from that town, right? I don't know what the town, ta- I'm new to Columbus, I don't know what the town is that, you know, has a particular accent that everyone goes, oh, they're from that town, right? But that's where Jesus was from. And that really expresses the powerful truth, right? That the Son of God was born not in the highest of places, in the most uh, prestigious of places. He was born to the place that people made fun of. And so Nathaniel then was told by Philip, come and see. And so Nathaniel comes to Jesus, and then uh, Jesus says, ah, look at this. this. Look at this guy. He's a true Israelite. And Nathaniel's like, what? What are you talking about? How do you know me? He says, I saw you under the fig tree. Which is interesting because the fig tree, that sentence is an expression in Jewish language. You, when you're sitting under a fig tree, that means you're studying Torah. And so Jesus saw Nathaniel studying Torah, studying the way. And so here is the way in a person says, I, hey, I saw you studying the Torah. And then what does uh, Nathaniel do? You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. In other words, he realizes that the Torah expressed a one that would come that would save the world, and this one who's standing before Nathaniel is the one. And so he confesses that you are the Messiah, you are the king of Israel. And it's just such a beautiful story of Philip following in the footsteps of Jesus and calling other disciples to follow Jesus. It's the example that all of us are called to is we're called to be disciples and we help others find Jesus also. Evangelism and discipleship to, to be disciples who make disciples. And so uh, Philip and Nathaniel follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so all of this expresses this understanding as disciples. We learn how to love God by following in the footsteps of Jesus. And so Philip followed Jesus. Nathaniel followed Jesus. And as disciples, we follow Jesus. And as we follow in the footsteps, imitating, as Paul says, be imitators of God. As we imitate Jesus, as we do the things that Jesus did, as we uh, love the way that Jesus loved, as we live the way that Jesus lived, that we express love for God. So here's the big idea for today, is we love God with our everything by following Jesus with our everything. We love God with our everything by following Jesus with our everything. And it's so important, and the reason why it's so important is because somehow the church, and I'm not saying this church, somehow the church has uh, forgotten about Jesus. We're really good about being Christian, 
but we've forgotten how to follow Jesus. And so the statistics show us that Christians, and I use that as a quote, don't follow the behaviors of Jesus very well. We statistically, as Christians, don't live like Jesus. And so we are good with words, but we struggle with our actions. And so for us, this is so important as a church because we're at a point as a church where we're f- our future is before us in such a way that we can make a decision today that determines the direction of who we are at Sandy Hook United Methodist Church into the future. And it affects the entire world. And we can decide today that we are going to live like Jesus. We are going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We're going to do the things that he did. We're going to say the things that he said. We're going to live like Jesus. We're going to love like Jesus. We're going to reach out to the people who are our enemies. We're going to reach out and bring food to those who don't have food to eat. We are going to love everybody. And by doing that, we tell God that we're loving him with our everything. And you might be thinking, wait, 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 does the Bible really teach that? Absolutely. The Bible calls us to wholehearted, life-encompassing, community-impacting, exclusive commitment to our God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible calls us to a wholehearted, life-encompassing, community-impacting, exclusive commitment to our God. And so we love God with our everything by following Jesus with our everything. And so how did, what did Jesus do? Well, John Wesley was challenged with this question, and John Wesley is a, uh, was a great, great theologian and one of the founding fathers of our denomination, and John Wesley said, there, Jesus practiced habits just like the Jewish people practiced habits, Jesus practiced habits for his disciples. He called them means of grace, in fact, he called them instituted means of grace, which means these are the habits of Jesus practiced. So John Wesley told his followers, his, the Methodist disciples, he says, let's follow and do the things that Jesus did. Let's do those habits. And he called them instituted means of grace. I don't like that terminology. It's hard to remember, so I simplified it. I call them grace habits. You could call them Jesus habits if you like. But he said there's five habits Jesus expressed that we are to follow. So I'd like to share those with you real quick and see in your life whether you are following in these Jesus habits or grace habits. The first one is reading scriptures. And so Jesus taught from the Torah. He taught constantly, and all of those teachings were recorded in what we call the Gospels. And so he encouraged us to read the scriptures. And so a disciple of Jesus has a value for the Torah, has a value for the Old Testament scriptures, and also has a value for the New Testament scriptures. And just as the Apostle Paul says it, all scriptures are useful. They are equipping us to be like Jesus. And the second grace habit, or the second Jesus habit, is prayer and fasting. And and so we, as a church, we encourage one another to pray and fast using spontaneous prayers and, and using a written prayers um, like the Book of Common Prayer or like the um, Methodist Book of Worship or any other good written set of prayers. And then also practice fasting. And fasting is a spiritual discipline that is important because we uh, allow the, the attachments that we have to the good things of, of God, like food, to make sure that we do not get um, allow them to become idols. And so by fasting, by pulling back a little bit, gives us the ability to make sure that our number one allegiance is to Jesus. The third grace habit or a Jesus habit is communion. Jesus taught us to take communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And by communion, we're going to take communion here in a minute, but also worship is the idea of communion. It's this idea of expressing our love and singing and, and, and reading liturgy and taking the sacraments and living a lifestyle of, of communion with God. And the fourth grace habit or Jesus habit is community, building relationships in the church, having brothers and sisters as a family of God, a fellowship, an alternative society, an alternative community in which we live as a family loving one another. Uh, And then the fifth is compassion. It's meeting the needs of those around us. It's loving others. It's it's, uh, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. It's feeding the hungry. It's clothing the naked. Compassion. Uh, John Wesley called them works of mercy. It's loving our city. It's loving our world. Um, 
loving one another. And so the, uh, the Jesus habit of compassion is something that he demonstrated for us. So those five habits, uh, reading scripture, prayer, prayer and fasting, communion, community, and compassion are things that Jesus did uh, to show us how to love God with our everything. And ultimately, we love God and we love others by following Jesus, modeling our lives after his, imitating him by the way that we live our lives. Following in the footsteps of Jesus is our proper response to the love of God. So what is our first root at Sandy Hook United Methodist Church? Our first root, our first value in response to the love that God shows us is to love God with our everything by following Jesus with our everything. And so I ask you today, how are you loving God, church family? How are you loving God? Does God know that you love him? Does God, are you known for loving God? And if so, how does God know that you love him? Is it the words that you say? Is it the way that we live our life? Is it by loving our neighbors as we love ourselves? What is the next step that God is asking you to take today? How are you in practicing those five Jesus habits? Um, reading the scriptures, praying and fasting, uh, communion, worship. Are you consistent in your worship? Or how about your community? Do you have accountability and loving relationships with your brothers and sisters? And, and also compassion. How are you reaching out to the neighbors and those in need around us? By doing those five things, by following in the footsteps of Jesus, we're expressing our love back to God. He loves us. He calls you his beloved child of God. And now we express that love back to him by following in the footsteps of Jesus, by living like Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and pr uh, protector of our faith. We look to Jesus as our model, the way that we are to live. We look to Jesus to determine how to get through the storms of life. We look to Jesus how to get through the difficult situations in our country. We look to Jesus when we have relational difficulties with those that are closest to us. We look to Jesus when we have relational difficulties with enemies. We look to Jesus on how to live our lives. And all of that is an expression of our love back to God. I close the sermon today with... Uh, the, that phrase, the Shema, and I add on the second commandment of Jesus, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, and we call this the Jesus Creed. And as a church, just like Jesus wrapping the uh, prayer shawl around his fingers, remembering what's important, today we say this together to remind ourselves. In fact, maybe a good habit to get into in your prayer life is to pray this every day. Or maybe follow in the footsteps of Jesus and pray it in morning and at night. Maybe to take that post-it note that I told you last week. Post-it notes are awesome. And maybe to write, love God, love neighbor, love self, and put it on your door frame. And then tap it when you come in and come out. Habits are important. Because in those habits, we remember what's important. Would you pray the Jesus Creed with me? Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these.